This session is to discuss the graduate programs in the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering offered through the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Ayana Teal and I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Marketing for the Whiting School of Engineering. We will begin this session with a brief overview of Johns Hopkins Engineering. Then, to provide you with a department overview and give you an opportunity to get answers to your questions, we have Professor and Chair of the Civil and Systems Engineering Department and Associate Director of the Hopkins Extreme Materials Institute, Dr. Lori Graham Brady, join us. Lori is a leading global researcher in the field of computational stochastic mechanics, multi-scale modeling of materials with random microstru microstructure in the mechanics of failure under high rate loading. Welcome everybody to um, our information session about the civil and systems engineering department. And um, I look forward to telling you a little bit more about both of our graduate programs, the doctoral and the master's programs. Thank you, Lori. Um, we also will have a graduate student panel join us later. Some of our favorite students who can uh, tell you a lot about the department and can share insights that I may not have uh, as a faculty member here many years, but uh, Ninja Baduri is a, a senior PhD student. Uh, Marietta Squire is a PhD candidate, um, I think in her third year. And uh, Boyu Chan is a master's candidate. So they should be able to speak to different parts of the graduate student experience. And today's agenda, today we will discuss engineering at Hopkins, an overview of the civil and systems engineering department, the admissions process, including some important dates, specific research areas, graduate student life, and finally a live question and answer session. You can type any questions you have in the live chat at any time and we will address those at the end of the formal presentation. Johns Hopkins University was the nation's first research university founded for the express purpose of putting discovery and knowledge to work for the good of humanity. Today, we are a top tier university and remain committed to academic excellence and pioneering research. For the past 38 years, Hopkins has led the U.S. higher education in research and development, spending a record $2.43 billion in fiscal 2016, and that amount increases every year. The Whiting School of Engineering is home to 11 graduate programs and more than 25 research centers and institutes. Because our research is interdisciplinary, our faculty work closely with the eight other divisions, including the School of Medicine, the Applied Physics Laboratory, and the Bloomberg School of Public, Public Health. We have expertise in including medicine and engineering, defense, information engineering, and resilient systems. It is the mission of the Whiting School to provide its students with an outstanding engineering education that is innovative, rigorous, and relevant, and prepares its graduates to be 21st century leaders. Some of the career resources available to our students include the Life Design Lab, where there are counselors specifically dedicated to graduate students, employer and alumni networking events, and resources for entrepreneurship. Now I will hand it back over to Dr. Brady, who will detail the civil and systems engineering program. Great, thank you, Ayana. Uh, so the department has actually literally in the moment um, is going through a major change. We've now become the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering. Uh, we have an announcement going out uh, tomorrow about this sort of a formal announcement, but it's, uh, it's happened. Uh, so we're looking at uh, now some grand societal challenges in sort of redefining ourselves and in particular some of the future challenges we've uh, identified for uh, infrastructure include resilient cities, space exploration and habitation, decision making and health, human safety and security, and the future energy infrastructure. And uh, we have faculty that contribute to pieces or all of or parts of um, all five of these uh, grand challenges. So um, to give you a sense of our numbers, we have 12 engineering faculty in, in the civil and systems engineering department. Uh, we have six lecturers and part-time faculty. We have eight postdoctoral scholars, 28 master's students in the current semester, and 48 PhD students. And our um, facilities include an advanced structures lab, 
um, the furnace for, uh, we have somebody who does a structural fire engineering, Thomas Gernet is one of our faculty. We have the computational mechanics research laboratory that's run by Professor Somnath Ghosh. Uh, we have a stereolithography 3D printer um, that actually a number of our faculty use. There's a thin walled structures laboratory, micro CT for 3D materials characterization. Um, high performance computing clusters, multiple, actually we have one at the department, but there's also a very large one um, for the university more broadly. Um, and we have some uh, laboratory looking at structural materials at high temperatures. And what you see here uh, in the picture is what we call the big blue baby, which is uh, one of our major structures labs. Uh, we have research collaborations all over. There's not a single faculty member in the department that does not collaborate outside of our department. Um, and in fact, that carries over to most of our graduate students as well. So we have collaborations with the Applied Physics Lab, the School of Public Health, the School of Arts and Sciences, uh, International Studies, Medicine, as well as other departments in the engineering school. We also have a number of collaborations that go outside the university, and this is just a random sampling. If I tried to put down the logo of every university that uh, some of our faculty are collaborating with, uh, it just becomes a big uh, garbled mess of, of icons. But this is just sort of a random sampling of places where our faculty and students have been collaborating. And then also industry and government organizations as well. And we receive funding from a number of different sources. Um, and again, I think this is not entirely exhaustive, but it, it gives a, the basic idea that we have funding from, from National Science Foundation, as well as industry, a lot of Department of Defense, NASA, and the NIH. So to give you a feel for the PhD program, um, typical timeline to completion is four to five years, maybe, um, yeah, that's a ballpark, the right amount. Um, we have eight courses that are required in the degree. The other requirements include a departmental qualifying exam that happens in the first year, a graduate board oral exam, and then finally, of course, the thesis dissertation. Um, we have a system in the first semester where a lot of our PhD students come in um, as part of a pool and they don't have a permanent advisor assigned yet and they work with a nominal advisor who helps them select courses in the first semester. And then uh, the students have a chance to go out and meet faculty before they decide on what their first, second, third choices would be for a permanent advisor. So it gives you a chance to have a more informed decision than um, from a distance uh, at some other institution trying to figure out who you might want to work with for the next uh, five years. It's a pretty big decision. As far as funding, our PhD students are all fully funded with stipend, tuition, and benefits, including health insurance. Now, the master's program requirements, typical timeline to completion is two to three semesters. Um, similar to the PhD, it's an eight course degree if you're doing the coursework only. Uh, a few students have decided to do a research thesis, and then it's seven courses plus a thesis. Uh, and there's an opportunity to do an externship during intercession, which has been really popular. It's a, a one to three week experience during January where our master's students can go out to industry um, or do research um, and get a feel for sort of an industrial setting. And even in a way, it's like a extended interview for the student at a company that they're particularly interested in potentially working later. Um, and in terms of funding, the majority of our master's stu students are receiving some form of financial aid. This is just a sampling of courses. We have both full-time and online courses, and we leverage the online program um, in our program as well because it gives us so many more course offerings. But um, this is not an exhaustive list on either side. It's just uh, a few that we picked out. Some are at the master's level, some are at the master's slash PhD level. Some are at the full-on PhD level um, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. The online program is a, a part-time master's uh, program that runs in parallel with our full-time program. And our students are able to take those online courses as well. All right, so uh, to talk about admissions a little bit, 
the application deadline is December 31st. Um, so, you know, Happy New Year. You'll be done with your application when you're uh, when you've submitted it. The application requirements include an online application um, that requires a statement of purpose, three letters of recommendation, the GRE, the TOEFL if appropriate, um, and transcripts. And we review the applications January through February. We try to move as quickly as possible. We make decisions by March, uh, typically at the latest. Uh, usually we try to move faster than that. Um, certainly all applicants would be notified by April. And we want to make a note that we have a lot of students here that are not necessarily civil engineering majors. I've had a student that was even a, an English literature uh, slash mathematics uh, major when she was an undergraduate, and it worked out very well. Um, so with a bachelor's, you can apply to the PhD program. You don't have to have a master's degree, um, and you don't have to feel like you have to be a civil engineer. And in fact, as we become the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering, uh, we've become even broader. This is the uh, profile of our typically admitted students. So you get a sense of GPA, GRE, TOEFL. Um, and as I say, for the PhD, our students are offered full financial aid. Now, uh, I'd like to give you some sense of our research. Uh, our areas of research look at three areas, mechanics of materials, structures, and systems. Um, they allow students to explore a wide range of scales. So you can look at the uh, something at the molecular scale to the world global society as a system at large. Uh, so we cover all those areas, uh, mechanics of materials clearly at the smaller scale, structures at the medium, and systems tend to be at the larger scale. I'll walk through each of those three areas just with a quick example of some research done there. So uh, mechanics of materials um, that we have five faculty, including myself, that are predominantly in mechanics of materials. I'll point out that a lot of our faculty cover two, if not three of these areas. So we just took a best guess at where we think people uh, have their most of their center of mass. Um, and so the kinds of things we look at are the prediction of deformation, fracture and fatigue, uh, design and materials for aircraft, topology optimization and design of materials, architect and materials, DNA, nanotechnology, and probabilistic uh, methods would be another. Um, so one example of a mechanics of materials problems is uh, looking at a antenna structure. And this is a multi-physics problem where you have to look at the uh, magnetic induction fields together with the um, mechanical behavior. And this was a simulation that was generated by one of our PhD students uh, who was in Professor Ghosh's group. Now going up in scale to structures, uh, we have four faculty that we'd, we say primarily identify with the structures area. They look at earthquake engineering, fire engineering, stochastic mechanics and structural reliability, cold form steel structures and optimization. And one example of a project that's been uh, ongoing in the structures area is in the cold form steel research uh, consortium. They looked at an earthquake engineering problem together with Bucknell University and the University of Buffalo. So this is a structural scale. It looks like a little picture, but this is actually a two story structure on an enormous shake table up in Buffalo, New York. Um, that was outfitted with uh, all sorts of uh, sensors and it underwent a series of uh, seismic events on the shake table and they looked at different failure mechanisms in the cold formed steel which is one of the most commonly used um, structural materials and then our last area sort of at the largest scale is systems again we have these faculty that predominantly associate with the systems engineering piece uh, within the department, we have a Center for System Science and Engineering that looks at energy infrastructure, self-driving cars, biosecure mobility, and healthcare management and optimization. And we had a um, kind of a splashy media example recently. One of our faculty, um, Lauren Gardner, uh, did some modeling to predict uh, measles outbreaks in the U.S. Uh, this was about six months ago when um, there was a measles outbreak in New York City and they were looking at where the next likely hotspots were for the measles epidemic. 
All right. Um, and then the last piece, I guess I'll talk about the student experience, but I'll let the students answered questions about their uh, student experience. So actually looking at this picture, it occurs to me, it might not be obvious what that is. That's a pile of steamed crabs, which is a very Baltimore thing. And we have the iconic Old Bay uh, in the corner and the wooden mallets. So Baltimore is a great city. I've lived here for 19 years. I live in the city. I live about five minutes away from campus. It's very workable city. It's easy to get around and it's got a lot to see and do. So it was ranked the number two food city in the US. Uh, I think the food here is fabulous and it's a great food, not pretentious kind of place. Um, so headquarters for Under Armour, the bay is nearby, you're not far from the ocean. There's all sorts of quirky events, festivals, street festivals all over the place. One of them is called Hun Fest, which is uh, sort of poking fun at what we call Huns, which is an iconic, I don't know, women from the 1960s that lived in uh, parts of Baltimore and wore, had beehive hairdos. And so it's a quirky, funny thing. They have things like a toilet race down the street. Uh, we have two major league sports teams. We have the Baltimore Ravens and the Baltimore Orioles. We also have, I think there's a professional indoor soccer. Um, and it's a, been rated as a hot startup city as well. So it's really a great place to live, work, and play. So uh, this is our house. It's right near campus. It's a sort of upscale food market. Our students are definitely uh, working hard there in the middle, but they also have a very active civil engineering graduate association. So beyond the civil engineering graduate association, there are a number of other graduate student organizations that span across the Whiting School of Engineering and the university more broadly. We also have a really strong department career fair. So the university has career fairs. Um, and there are companies that come in from all over for that. But we also have a specialty department career fair that brings in about 20 companies this year. I think there were 40 students there for 20 companies. So every student had plenty of time to uh, get to know prospective employers. And there are a lot of internships and jobs that come out of our department career fair. We just held it about a month ago. And to give you a feel of where do our students go from here? So what's next for them? Uh, we have alumni that go on to academic positions. Obviously this is mostly from our PhD program. So they go on to assistant professorships or lectureships or uh, postdoctoral experiences. We also have a number of alumni, both from the master's program and from the PhD program that move on to government and military positions. And then finally, we have an enormous number of students from both the PhD and the master's program that go on to industry experiences. And I should point out, these lists are not exhaustive. So this isn't every place where all of our students have gone. We just tried to find a representative uh, cross section to share with you. So we have our graduate students with us. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessica Ader. I'm the communications specialist for the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering. Um, I'm here with our graduate student panel. Um, and they can either, they're going to start off by telling you a little bit of who they are and what research they're doing. And then if you have any questions about the student experience, um, please let us know. We're here to help. Uh, hi there, I'm Anindya. I'm a senior PhD student in this department working with Professor Laurie Graham Brady. So uh, my research is basically on uh, uncertainty propagation. Uh, it's basically developing different surrogate modeling algorithms and applying it uh, to problems in the field of computational mechanics. Good morning. Uh, my name is Marietta Squire. I'm a PhD candidate student here. Um, I work with Professor uh, Takagusa. I work with modeling um, in the healthcare environment to use mathematical tools to try and prove to try and determine how to make hospitals as safe as possible, as well as some uh, an energy project that looks at energy distribution and prioritization in hospitals in areas of power distressed areas, and then some other uh, computational tools. Morning, I'm Boyu. So uh, I'm second year master of here, and uh, I'm doing a course based uh, master program. So yeah, I don't have research. Yet. I mean, uh, but I'm doing research with Professor Schaefer right now about the, the cold foam steel 
like uh, just some students say the thesis for the MSE, I say like a uh, thesis, maybe it's uh, but, uh, hard, but uh, like if you want to uh, sign research or follow student, I mean, follow the professor to study how research is going, like uh, you can email to professor to get more information after you come here. Okay, so there's a question that says, do you recommend contacting faculty about their research before applying? I know some departments recommend it and some don't, especially since considering this person is considering an MSE with thesis. Um, finding research match may not be as important. So how did you guys find your research advisor? How did that work? Did you email them prior or are you, once you got here, is that something that you emailed around? What I did, I, I actually did a pre-application. I, I sent out Professor Laura Graham Brady an email regarding kind of what kind of projects she might or might not have and kind of trying to have a, have, a, have an idea of what can I expect after coming here and what kind of means and trying to make sure whether I have a kind of a match with, with her field of research. So that kind of really helped me kind of consider uh, this department as an option for doing research. So. Personally, I, I really recommend it. Uh, I, I emailed my um, a, a few different advisors at a few different schools um, while I was in the application process. I think depending on what program you're doing, if you're looking to do definitely do a thesis with your master's, then you want to ensure that whoever you're going to work with, that there's some a faculty member that has similar lines of interest. That's pretty important. And then for me, um, yes, I, I did it, it, but I'm in the PhD program, so it might be a little different than what you're referring to. But I emailed um, my advisor and, and talked with him via email a bit to, you know, about some areas of interest that I was working on that I also saw the similarities between his work and what I was interested in. So if I could pipe in a little bit uh, as well on that question, um, I think thinking about a, a master's with a thesis research, I think you could approach people before applying um, and and see if they're people that you're interested in working with. But there's also various places, various times in the process you could do that. Um, it would be fine to wait to just apply and then after admissions, then you know come in for a visit, find out more about the department, decide if it's the right option for you, and meet with faculty then and talk about research. Or um, it even sounds like, I think, Boyu, your case was the, you got here and then you um, found research after you got here and uh, that worked out well as, uh, as an option too. So I think you don't feel, you shouldn't feel like you have to uh, contact faculty before applying, but you're certainly welcome to. I saw Arafat had a question about construction management. So asking, do we plan to offer construction management, BIM, new tech and construction, big data in the near future? You know, I, honestly, probably not. Um, we don't really have a lot of construction management here at Hopkins. Um, something that we've toyed with is maybe at some point putting something together with our Center for Leadership Education. Um, but I think that's on a longer time frame than you're probably looking at right now. Um, Patrick, I'm sure this question is for the students, is asking if you all have much time for fun. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you have your bit of fun throughout, especially in this department, as I guess Laurie mentioned before, we have a graduate association here, uh, it's called SEGA. So it's a, it's a very close-knit department, and I guess SEGA has played a major role in it, and you have coffee hours, happy hours, you have movie nights, you have uh, fall trips, you have all sorts of events going on throughout the year, which will make your stay here a, a fun one. So definitely we have a lot of fun out here. The quality of life at Hopkins is just the great people year round. And people are fantastic. People are nice. As um, Professor Grant Brady mentioned, people are pretentious. The people here are wonderful. The research is great. So you work hard, but you also have plenty of opportunities for fun. People care. People want to help you. I mean, this is a great place to go to school, and this is a fantastic department. <laughs> so, yes, and Baltimore, there's lots to see. Things are close. You know, it's, I've lived in places that are very remote, and it's very hard to get to things. And here, things are geographically close, and um, there's lots of different activities, depending on what your, interest, your interests are. Plenty of restaurants to go to, very different types of restaurants. So, yes, I would say you definitely have time for things outside of school. 
Oh, uh, just say uh, it's also a lot of fun, like outside of Baltimore City, because you can go to DC. It's very close. It's only uh, forty five minutes, and you can take a train. And uh, uh, in April, you can go to the Cherry Blossom Festival in the DC. It's very beautiful, and uh, you can also to the ski. It's about an, 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 just an hour from the Baltimore City, so in during winter, so still have a lot of activities like outside of the city. You can go. Great, thank you for that. Yes, you can get to and from. DC for fourteen dollars on the Mark train, so it's easily accessible to DC and all of the other fun East Coast cities. That is the end of the formal presentation, and we have received one question online, and then I'll also ask a question that I received via email. Um, the first question online here is: Can research track students participate in internships? So this is a relatively new thing for us. We do have students that have gone on to do, um, have done internships during their PhD. It's one of those things that it has to be a specific situation that's worked out between the advisor and the prospective um, internship site, but it's something that we're seeing increasingly common uh, in the PhD program. The next question from Patrick, you seem to suggest that the thesis option isn't common for master's students. Do I have the right, is there good support for master's students during doing a thesis? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I don't think that, it's not that we don't have a lot of master's students doing thesis because we don't want them to. It's just for whatever reason, a lot of our students want to come and do a course only master's um, kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe if the philosophy is quick in, quick out kind of thinking, I'm not sure. So we do have students that do a thesis. We have students that um, are able to sometimes get support for that thesis. If you're talking about financial support, there's certainly good support in terms of you know faculty interest. It's just one of those things that's a little more work. It's worked out on a more case by case basis if it's appropriate for the student um, and there's a project that they're interested in. But it's not, again, I wanna emphasize the thesis option not being as common is not a function of us putting a limit on it. It's more a function of what the students uh, seem to want to do. Okay, great, thank you for that. A question that was emailed earlier, what is the implication of the addition of systems engineering for my PhD degree to your department? Oh, so, well, it depends, right? So if you're interested in um, civil engineering, it really doesn't affect anything uh, because we will continue to offer degrees in civil engineering at all levels. There'll be a bachelor's, master's, PhD, all will say civil engineering. What we're adding is a parallel track that will be systems engineering at the bachelor's, master's, and PhD level. The thing is that hasn't that's not ready yet. So we have a number of accreditation hoops that we have to run through to add a new degree program. So for somebody who's interested in systems engineering, that's something that's coming online, you know, desperately hoping for next year, but I can't promise that, obviously. If somebody's interested in civil engineering, it really doesn't change much. I guess one thing that does change is that the department name formally now says we are civil and systems engineering. Somebody gets a degree from this department, they can say I was in the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering. So I think it expands what we uh, define ourselves as and what our students, the kinds of capabilities that our students will be able to develop. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer, Lori. Patrick is asking, do you have admission statistics on for master students, GRE scores and GPA? Ah, that's a good question. I don't offhand. I wonder if we could gather those. We could help, yes. We, we could yeah. help gather some some data, Patrick, um, and, and get that information over to you. Yeah, sorry about that. That's actually a very good question. We should. I hope we we hear from you all soon. 